exercises for these first few chapters and fewer in the end. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to keep up with the lecturers, uh, do some exercises, selected exercises from chapters three and four that I think are instructive. Tomorrow I'll probably do some more um, on the same two chapters, some uh, gymnastics with the uh, Fourier expansion and so on. And uh, next week I'll probably um, do prove KKL outside of P a half and maybe some other sort of leftover theorem, leftover lemmas from the lectures. But um, if there's, so there's plenty of exercises on chapter one that I didn't do. If you have any questions about any of them, obviously feel free to ask me. So the first thing I'll do today is to is to um, what we call exercise 3.3. Um, I'll prove the finite size criterion. For percolation. So the finite size criterion goes as follows. Suppose that suppose that there is some large number n, supposedly large, such that the probability of crossing a 2n by n box, actually I'll cross a 2n by n minus 1 box just for keeping some technicalities out of the problem, um, such that this probability is at least 0.98. Then indeed, okay, so this probability is taken at a certain parameter p. Then indeed, this parameter p is greater than, is sub supercritical. Oh, maybe I should instead write, because we're not, and I should rather write theta of p is positive, meaning that we indeed do percolate. Okay, so this should, once you see it, it, it's a great tool. It's the tool for, a, one of the main tools for proving that the critical value indeed is a half. But you should also think about it as a, a, a um, rather fascinating lemma itself because it says something about what happens in a finite size box. If, and then Using this, you can actually deduce percolation on the whole lattice. OK, cool. So how do we do this? It's not a terribly hard lemma, but it involves some, some sort of geometric constructions. So what we want to prove, we want to prove that we percolate with positive, I mean, that the origin percolates with positive probability or equivalently that there is percolation somewhere, meaning that, um, that there is an infinite cluster somewhere. So what's our favorite way of constructing an infinite, an infinite cluster in our lattice? We quite typically would want to do something like this, right? If we can cross this box here and then draw another box over here that we're crossing, then draw another box that we're also crossing. And we'll draw another box, which we're crossing bottom to top, and so on. Then these boxes, these, the crossings of these boxes are obviously going to constitute a infinite cluster, right? So we want to prove that there is one nice way of proving percolation is proving the existence of something like this somewhere in the lattice. Yeah. 
Indeed, we don't even need to show this, right? We only need to show that all, but we don't need to show that all of these boxes are crossed. We only need to show that all but finitely many of them are crossed, right? Because if only finitely many of these crossings fail, well, then you just ignore these first 2,000 million boxes and consider the rest of them, they are, still go they are all going to be crossed and that's going to constitute an infinite cluster. So we want to prove that there's some construction like this where all but finitely many um, are crossed. And since we have, since we, our original statement says something about two n by n boxes, it feels natural to, to, to let, this, uh, let this picture be, be, be made up by boxes of proportions 2n by n, but obviously of larger and larger size, okay? So n is going to grow. What's a nice way to prove that all but finitely many in a sequence of events occur? Well, obviously, the borel cantelli lemma, OK? So what we want to show is that the complement event, the complementary event of these crossings fail for only finitely many things, for only finitely many boxes. OK. Uh, the complement, oh, we want to show that the, the event fails for only finitely many of the boxes. The complementary, uh, complement event occurs, right? Okay, so it's 6.50 p.m. That's my excuse. So how do we show only finitely many of these complement events occur? Well, we show that the probabilities of the complement events are, uh, are uh, summable. By borel Cantelli suffices to show that probabilities of the complement events are summable. OK. So what do I mean by this? This is, um, by this I mean, let's see if we have some red cock. Red shark here. OK, so what are the complement events here? Well, the complement event in this first box, the complement of this white crossing occurring is obviously a red crossing like this. So this is this red crossing here I call E1. The complement event of this vertical crossing would be crossing like this, which I call E2. Then we have a crossing here, E3, another crossing E4, and so on. So we want to show that the sum over I of the probability of the event EI is finite. The event EI is just crossing, what's the size of this? This is a 2 to the i times n t by 
2 to the i plus 1 n box crossed in this manner. OK, that's what we want to show, that the sum of these probabilities, as i tends, goes from 1 to infinity, the sum of these events is finite. And to show that, again, suffices to show the probability of EI is bounded by something exponential. Um, for example, 1 over 1 over 2 to the i times epsilon. Well, I mean, we don't even need this epsilon, but this is how we're going to do it. Okay, so we want something like this to hold. The way we show this is that, I mean, this is essentially exactly what I wrote down here. That's a lemma that if the probability of crossing this if the probability of crossing this box is less than epsilon, then the probability, let this be an m by 2m box, then the probability of crossing something that's twice as big, a 2m by 4m box, that's going to be smaller than epsilon halves. Do everybody agree that this is exactly what I want to show? OK, and I, it suffices to prove this. I mean, if I can prove this for large enough m and for small enough epsilon, this will do. OK, so I claim that epsilon smaller than point zero two will do, and this will hold for any m. Epsilon, the reason that, I mean, I can prove this lemma for epsilon smaller than point zero two. It's obviously true for some larger values of epsilon as well, but my proof will go through for epsilon smaller than point zero two, and that exactly corresponds to why we choose point nine eight in the formulation of the theorem, right? Okay, so first, any questions so far? Okay, no questions so far. Then, any suggestions on how to proceed? Why would it be twice as difficult to cross this 2m by 4m box? Why would crossing this vertically be twice as hard as crossing this thing vertically. Observe that it's highly dependent on the fact that epsilon is small enough. OK, so I'm going to go to and fro widely between the complement events and the, the primal events, between the vertical white crossings and the, um, the, the horizontal white crossings and the vertical red ones. But um, I hope you won't. 
that won't disturb you. So obviously we want to, in some way, say that a horizontal crossing occurs with high probability, that we can build them in very many ways from our horizontal crossings of our smaller boxes. So I'm going to write something like this. The probability of a cr such a crossing occurring is at least the probability of I'm going to divide this 4m by 2m box into two th such things. So the probability of crossing horizontally is, of course, at least the probability of crossing the upper half horizontally plus the probability of... Um, <coughs> no, 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 no. The union of the two. So, do I really mean the? I really mean the uh, complementary events here. Sorry. Probability of such a red crossing is smaller than or equal to the probability of this thing plus the probability of this thing. It's going to be a product. It's going to be a product. Exactly. So, yeah, precisely. So the, the, the crucial point here is, I'm, I'm sorry about confusing this thing, obviously, this, for this thing to occur, you have to cross the upper half, you have to cross the lower half, and these things happen independently. Okay, so this is a very, very rough estimate because, of course, if it's hard to cross these things, then you typically won't, then this red crossing will typically not at all be in the same kind of point as this red crossing, so it's a very rough estimate. But anyway, and these things happen independently because the, what happens in the upper half of the box and what happens in the lower half of the box is independent. Okay, there we go. Uh huh. So now we need to show that the probability of crossing a 4n by n box horizontally is reasonably small. Or in other words, that crossing a 4n by n box, 4n by n box horizontally like this, is reasonably large. So I need to show that it, we have a fair chance of crossing this one horizontally. I want to bound this probability from below. And the only thing we know is that we have, we're good at crossing 2n by n boxes. We're good at crossing 2n by n boxes, and we want to conclude we're fairly good at crossing 4n by n boxes. So what we do is, of course, we divide our 4n by n box into 2n by n boxes, right? I will do it as follows. In fact, I'll divide it into n by n boxes, but they are connected in a nice way. So here's a nice way to get a crossing like this. 
I cross the first two n by n box like that. Cross the second n by n box vertically. Cross the middle two n by n box horizontally. Cross the second, this one vertically. And then I cross this one like that. OK, so now I need, for this to happen, I need to cross. Well, I don't, need, I don't even need to cross five. All of these boxes are not two n by n. But if I cross five different n, two n by n boxes, we're fine. So what's the probability of this happening? Well, that's, of course, at least 1 minus the probability of 1 minus the sum of the probability of the complement event, right? If there are five events that should occur, five of these crossings, so there are five complement events. Each of the complement events consists of crossing a box like that. So has probability, has probability that is uh, at most epsilon. OK, so remember epsilon, epsilon was our probability of crossing a 2n by n box vertically in the dual setting. OK, so this, yeah? Oh, because it's uh, because this is just an estimate. Because um, crossing this one like that is going to be harder than crossing the, t the corresponding two m by m box. Yes, good question. Okay, so this is this is a rough estimate then. So if you want to, I could I could really make an even rougher estimate of the of the white things and say that we I ask that we actually cross like this. Which obviously doesn't happen. Uh huh. Okay, so the probability of this happening is at least one minus five epsilon. So this is this is at most probability of this happening is at most five epsilon. Probability of this happening is at most five epsilon. Together is at most five epsilon squared. That's 25 epsilon squared equals 25 epsilon times epsilon for those who are good at algebra. 25 epsilon when epsilon is smaller than 0.02. 25 epsilon is going to be smaller than a half. So this is going to be smaller than or equal to epsilon halves, which was what we wanted to show over that, right? Questions on that? I never used FKG. I, if I if I didn't want to look at complementary events here, I could I could use FKG to prove that the probability of this, the probability of these white crossings is indeed of these of these is at least I could replace this one minus five epsilon by one minus epsilon to the fifth power, which is a sharper estimate than one minus five epsilon. For that, I would need FKG, because I would need that these things are positively correlated. But I only need, I don't need the sharper estimate I, I, I can do with only 1 minus 5 epsilon. So I don't need FKG. On the other hand, FKG is a really, really standard tool. So I mean, it's, I wouldn't consider it a high price to, to use FKG to prove a thing like this. OK, so. I showed that I showed that the probabilities of crossing these two two by one proportion boxes decreases exponentially in M. Since that increases exponentially in M, there, the um, the probabilities are summable. Since the probabilities are summable, only finitely many of these complement events will occur. So. All but finitely many of these white crossings that Ruby 4 will occur. 
and that'll suffice to give us one infinite cluster, which shows that the probability of percolating, uh, I mean, that we do percolate and the probability of percolating from the origin is, of course, positive by just um, translation invariance, if you want. Okay, if there's no questions, on, no further questions on that, I'll go to a quite other issue. Um, so if there are questions, please post them here. Now I want to show, yesterday I claimed that, okay, so we saw that majority had, the influences in majority was one over square root of n times some constant. We said that, okay, so that's kind of fairly small, but on the other hand, that's really as, on the other hand, it's really as large as we can get for a transitive function. How do I prove it's as large as we get for a transitive function? Well, of course, I'm saying, well, the only thing I need to show to show that is that it really has the largest total influence. So I'm claiming that majority of all functions, majority when p is a half, majority is the one with the highest total influence. Monotone function. Monotone function, of course, yes. Thank you. Monotone uh, is a standard assumption, but it's, of course, you shouldn't forget it. Because, for example, parity obviously always has total influence equal n. So this statement that that majority is has the highest total influence this is true not only up to constants but it's really it's really true for real So once I've erased I shall ask if anybody has an idea on how to prove it I'm not asking for a complete proof, but just some tool that we have learned possibly today to prove such a thing or to, that might come in handy. So we did learn quite a cute expression of the, of the total influence, right? And there's a reason I'm putting a one half on top here, although I'm not usually putting out the uh, parameter a half explicitly, there's really a reason this time. Recall the Russo formula. That the total influence at parameter P of an event or of a function, if you like, equals the derivative with respect to P of the probability that the event occurs. Okay, so this is kind of backwards. I mean, we have, we have a very sort of, we have an influence which at least I think of as a sort of pre, 
pretty hands-on object and a sort of much more not so hands-on object, namely the derivative of this probability, but in fact it's going to come in handy, it's going to be easier to calculate the right-hand side. Did you mean I didn't mean to write transitive. So what I said was uh, if you have a transitive, okay, since this holds true, this also proves that for transitive functions, this is going to have the highest individual influences. Okay. But, um, but the, um, this inequality holds for any function, for any monotone function. So the ordinary sort of majority voting scheme is the one where an individual voter has the highest pr probability of actually changing the outcome. Okay, so, so we want to, this thing is a constant, this thing is something, an invariant of f, we want to express this and, and bound this. So let's express it. And let's express it in the slightly more general situation where p isn't necessarily a half. So I, p of f equals, well I've already written that there, Oh, that's good, and I won't have to write it again. So what's this? This is derivative with respect to p of, what's the probability of f being 1? Well, that's just the sum of all outcomes the indicator function of f being 1 times the probability of that outcome. The probability of that outcome is, of course, p to the power of the number of 1s in omega times 1 minus p to the power of n minus the size of omega. This is the number of minus 1s. This here is the number of 1s in the sequence omega. OK, this is something that is uh, useful to think about now and again the fact that this probability actually is a polynomial. It's exactly this polynomial. So whenever we do something strange about uh, the, the, the probability there, and we want, may wonder, OK, so is this really valid for this function? Well, this function is actually a polynomial, so it's as smooth and nice as it gets. OK, and how do we differentiate a polynomial? Well, we learned that in first, first calculus course, and we learned it before then, I guess. So this is going to be the sum over all omega, indicator function f equals 1, times p to the size of omega minus 1, times 1 minus p to the n minus size omega, times size omega, plus, so there I differentiated the p thing, then I should differentiate that one. We have an inner derivative, so it's a minus sign, blah, blah, blah. p to the size of omega, 1 minus p to the n minus size of omega minus 1 times n minus size of omega. You do the calculations. I get my cheating paper so I don't make the wrong calculations. Indicate a function of f equals 1 when f is a 0, 1 function is kind of a silly thing to write. I might as well write f of omega there. <laughs> okay, um, size of omega, f of omega, p to the size of omega minus 1, 1 minus p to the n minus size of omega minus 1 times size of omega minus np. Trust me, you'll do it. So now I'm going to want to bound this thing. I'm going to want to bound this thing. What's a nice way of doing it? Well, 
I could start with not, with just ignoring the terms where this factor is going to give us something negative, right? If this is negative, then we're not, certainly not going to gain from it. So I bound it by the sum over omega, the sum over such omega that have size larger than NP, f of omega p to the blah, 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 blah. Ah, my right is eight. Okay, we only gain from that. So what happens now? Now suddenly here's something non-negative. Every, every term here is non-negative. So I might as well kill the ones which have function zero. I mean, or, or rather, this one, if this one is ever zero, this just kills terms. So I might as well bound by bound this f of omega by constant function one. So this thing is smaller than or equal to the sum overall omega of large enough size times this thing. And this thing is suddenly not depending on the function anymore. So we've got a bound that's independent of the function. Oh, that's really good. So we've got an upper bound. I wonder if that's ever tight. Is that ever tight over here? Yeah, well, it's tight for the majority function, right? Majority in this case meaning the function that's one whenever omega is larger than NP and zero otherwise. Well, for that function, it's certainly tight over here because we, because we had f equals zero anyway if this thing was negative. And, of course, this equality is tight as, inequality is tight as well because if, as soon as omega is large enough, uh, f will be one. So this is tight for the function that is one if omega is large enough and zero otherwise. If p equals a half, this is just the majority function, and we're bounded by the majority function. Where, where I got it? Yeah. Uh, oh, let's see now. So from from here I got one. So from here I got omega minus omega p. Sorry, from from second line to third line. Okay, so what I did was if omega if omega is smaller than n p then this thing is going to be negative. This is positive, this is positive, this is non-negative. So the terms you are ignoring, the terms you are ignoring in this sum were only negative terms. So... Oh, yes, 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 okay, but I, I really... Um, Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course it, should, it should follow me down. Okay. And it should obviously follow me down here too. Okay. Thanks for pointing it out. But it still doesn't depend on F. That's the point. Exactly. And, if, and for every p, it's the natural, uh, the natural equivalent, I mean, the natural analog of the majority function. So for every single p, I know the function with the total largest total influence, and it's really the one that asks, are there 
the function that asks, are there more bits plus one than there should be or less than there should be? That's the function with the highest total inference for every given p. Very nice. And this is, I mean, this should, if you want to, you could think of this as sort of anticipating the, the um, majority is stablest and a lot of theorems in that, in that sort of, um, with that sort of flavor that tells you that majority is an exceptional voting scheme in, in different ways. So I'm going to go uh, move over, if there's no more questions, I'm going to go over to chapter four. I'm going to uh, do, well, I'll first do a really, really easy thing, um, namely 4.1, which I proved yesterday, but I'm going to prove it in a much faster way today using the Fourier spectrum, just to show that the Fourier spectrum is kind of nice. So I'm going to prove the Poincaré inequality once again. The one saying that the variance is bounded from above by the total influence. So I will prove that the variance of F is not larger than total influence of F, where I guess I'll get it right this time, F goes from omega n to plus minus one. Now, of course, by definition, the variance of f can be written as expectation of f squared minus the expectation of f squared. f squared as we're mapping into, as we're mapping into uh, plus and minus one, of course the expectation of f squared is one. The expectation of f, on the other hand, was, as Jeff told us in the lecture today, that's the Fourier coefficient of the character of the empty set. And since we wanted to square that, we should square that. So now what's the total influence in terms of the Fourier spectrum? Well, the total influence is by definition the sum over all i, the influence of the ith bit, which is the sum over all i. What was the influence of the ith bit? Well, Jeff showed us today that that is the sum over all sum over all sets S in which contain the bit I, sum over all S that contain I of their Fourier coefficient squared. Now if I sum this over all I, then we can just sort of interchange the order of summation. So I sum over all S, then I sum over all I that are in this set S, F hat of S squared. Now I, s I take the same thing and sum it over all the things that are in I, 
that are in the S, obviously that's going to just amount to multiplying by the size of S. Okay. Now I'm going to do a very rough bound on this thing. This thing is greater than or equal to the size over all s, f hat of s squared. I'm just replacing this s, size of s by 1. This inequality doesn't quite always hold. We have to subtract, of course, f hat of the empty set squared. Right? Because the empty set has size 0, so that's counted no times there but once in this sum. So from here to here, from here to here, there's a very rough estimate. And we should think of this as a very rough estimate, in spe especially if f hat, the Fourier spectrum, is concentrated on large sets. And we learned that co being concentrated on large sets corresponds to it being noise sensitive. So this inequality is very, very rough, especially for noise-sensitive functions. But what is this? This thing again is just the L2 norm of the function f, I guess, squared by the, uh, by the, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, if you like. Which, in this case, of course, is equal to 1. OK. Because remember, this is just another basis of the function. Uh, these are the coefficients in an orthonormal basis of the function f. So that's where, that's why this, where this comes from. So what we've got here in the end is i of f, big I of f, is larger than 1 minus f hat of empty set squared, which we showed up there was equal to the variance of f. So this inequality that we showed with some sort of probabilistic um, walking along a path method yesterday can really smoothly be shown, proven in um, uh, using the Fourier spectrum and we gain support for our intuition, the intuition we should have that if, uh, if a function is noise sensitive then the variance is really obviously not so large but the total influence can be quite much larger. Hmm. Questions? So I've got 25 more minutes. I hope I won't have to use all of them, but I'll, they should be enough anyway to prove or to do exercise 4.6, the one where I prove that a seemingly stronger definition of noise sensitivity is in fact equivalent to the one we're familiar with. So to write it out in words first, I'm going to show, or I'm going to let you show, that if a n is noise sensitive then the probability of omega epsilon is in a n conditioned on the outcome omega minus the probability of an 
this difference should tend to zero in probability as n goes to infinity, obviously. So you should think of this as, I mean, obviously by, the, by what we're going to show, it's equivalent with noise sensitivity, but you should think of it as something that's a priori stronger than, than noise sensitivity because it tells you that the outcome, the outcome or the function value in omega epsilon is not only independent of the outcome of the function value in omega, but of the but it's independent of the actual outcome omega, asymptotically obviously. I should say, obviously, that um, the an being, oh, you can't read from here, can you? I should obviously say that an being noise sensitive means that the indicator function of an is noise sensitive. So obviously better wait until the board is dry, but does anybody have any ideas? I'm going to use Fn to denote the indicator function of An. That's a very good guess. Let's see if there is. So first, of course, I'm writing out. Uh, uh, there should be no hat there, but there should be a hat in the next expression, obviously. <laughs> Maybe that was a giveaway, but that's, that was unintentional, I promise. So we just write out the Fourier expansion of Fn as the sum over S, F hat of S, chi S of omega. And do the obvious things here. We use linearity. F hat of S, expected value of chi S of omega conditioned on 
omega, omega epsilon over there, omega epsilon over there, omega on the right hand side. So as you said, maybe there's so maybe you can express this thing very neatly. This thing has no longer anything to do with f hat, right? So the f hats are the same, of course, because it's the same function f. So there's no, we don't even need any relation between the f hats. What we need is some nice way to express this thing. Maybe even something you can talk about probabilistically. Ideas? So, I mean, it's an expected thing, it's an expected value. Remember that chi s is only the product of the, of the omega values in the bits indexed by s. Omega epsilon is just omega noised in the way that every bit is re-randomized with probability epsilon. I use independence of... Yes. Okay. So, what's this? I can sort of... The way I think about this is I divide this into two cases. Either omega epsilon is really flipped at some of the bits from S, or it's not. Okay, so if it is flipped, if some of the bits in S are flipped when going from omega to omega epsilon, then obviously we can't have any clue whatsoever what chi S of omega epsilon is. Because these bits that we re-randomize can be 1 and minus 1 with equal probability, and we no longer know anything. But on the other hand, if none of the bits are re-randomized, going from omega to omega epsilon, well then obviously chi S of omega epsilon is equal to chi S of omega. Okay, so this is just, this um, expected value is just chi S of omega times the probability that no bit in S is re-randomized. What's the probability that no bit in S is re-randomized? Well, each bit is re-randomized with probability epsilon, so a bit is not re-randomized with probability 1 minus epsilon, and each of these things happen independently, so what we get in the end is sum over S, F hat of S, chi S of omega, 1 minus, ep 1 minus epsilon, to the power of the size of S. There we go. So that's what, that's what this probability was. And now we want to subtract the probability of AN. Well, that we could probably treat as well. Let's try. Probability of probability of an is just the expected value of fn and the expected value of a function we said was just the Fourier coefficient corresponding to the empty set and if we want to we could obviously multiply by chi empty set of omega because chi empty set is constantly one. That's the character that's constantly one. Aha, uh -huh, so this probability of an really was only the first term in this thing because when s is the empty set, this thing is going to be one and this thing is going to remain, right? So it suffices to show that the sum of the non-empty guys, f hat of s, k s of omega, 1 minus epsilon to the size of s. Now this thing, that's really the difference that we're after in the formulation. 
we need to show that this thing tends to zero in probability as n goes to infinity. And the only assumption we know about f is that f is noise sensitive. Recall that if n is noise sensitive, well, that told us something about the about the Fourier coefficients, right? It told us that um, it told us that and told us that for every k, the probability, or for every k, another way of saying this is the Fourier coefficients, squares of the Fourier coefficients, over the sets that have size that are non-empty but have size smaller than k, this thing goes to zero with n. That's what noise sensitive meant. So in the lecture today, um, I guess, uh, in the lecture today, from what I remember, we didn't see the sum from zero to k, but just the sum over all s's with size k. But of course, since this is a finite sum, it doesn't matter. It doesn't know difference. So we can as well use this formulation. So we know that the sum of the Fourier coefficients on the first k levels goes to zero. How do we exploit this? It's sort of the punchline left. You guys have a good punchline? Right. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so to show that this goes to zero in probability, we're happy with showing that the L2 norm of it, or the variance of it, goes to zero. Okay. So let's prove that. The L2 norm of this thing, well, squared perhaps, is just the sum over all non-empty S's f hat squared 1 minus epsilon to, the, to twice the size of s times the expectation of chi s of omega squared. Well, chi s of omega is a plus minus 1 function, so its square is always 1, so we, this one is killed. And only this remains on the battlefield. And um, now we can sort of we want this to go to zero. Well, it clearly does because we, for example, we want to show that this is smaller than delta for every delta, if n is large enough. Well, let's, for example, do this by just some rough estimates. We start by taking the small case, f hat of s squared, plus the sum over all the large s's, size s is larger than k, 
1 minus epsilon to the k. This is obviously a, this is obviously a, a rather rough estimate where, where k is so large that it's so large that this thing is smaller than delta. No, 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 sorry, sorry. It's so large that this thing is smaller than delta. Du, 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 du. 2K, obviously. Oh, we don't, no, 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 sorry. We don't even need to sum over the, pos the large S's. That's the crucial point, yeah. A crucial point. Because note that the sum of these Fourier coefficients over here, or the sum of the sum of the, even the sum of the large, the sum of the co Fourier coefficients is smaller than one. Okay. Sum of the Fourier coefficients is at most one because it's a function that it takes value zero, plus minus one. Ah, oh, it takes the values zero and one, I guess, so it's strictly smaller than that, right? Okay, so we only get one minus epsilon to the two K there. Now we can choose, choose k so large that the, this thing is smaller than delta, and then when n is large enough, when n is large enough, then this big sum is smaller than delta as well by noise sensitivity. And to conclude, if n is large enough, the L2 norm that we wanted to that we wanted to consider is smaller than two delta, so it goes to zero. Variance goes to zero, so the function goes to zero in probability. This function was again just the difference between between the expectation of the expectation of f of omega epsilon given omega minus the expectation of omega uh, the expectation of fn in the first place did you more or less follow that do you have any questions or suggestions on how to do it smoother Okay, so I think this is rather rather neat application of the of the uh, Fourier express Fourier expression of what it means to be noise sensitive. It's sort of our first our first um, example that proves that this is really a a, a nice way to express that. Um, the converse the converse is as I hinted the converse is more elementary. So you should really think of this as something that's a priori stronger than noise sensitivity. The converse is in exercise D, and I've got five minutes left. Do you want to see it, or do you not want to see it? It's a very, I mean, I think if you follow the course so far, then you can do it, uh, but it's quite a neat exercise. So if you haven't tried it, I suggest you do try it, uh, and come to me if you have any questions about it. Thank you.